Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you again. It's been a while. Always glad to come down to Fifth Avenue Chapel in Belmar. A lot of good memories here for me. A lot of good times on vacation Bible school with kids over the years. And uh, I just want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be involved in those kinds of things years ago. I've turned over the vacation Bible schools to others now. And um, enjoyed a little bit of freedom you know, of uh, time. And it's been good just to, to know that uh, the Lord is there with us day by day. We're uh, doing okay at Kenilworth Gospel Chapel. We're not quite back to full capacity yet. We have uh, our services in the premises each Sunday, Sunday morning only. Although there's a Bible study that meets on Monday mornings. I'm glad to see, we see about 50% of the people that have come back on Sunday mornings. The rest are going Zoom and listening to the ministry of the word. It's not the same. Things have changed. We're all getting used to it. It's hard for me to wear a mask. I'm so glad I'm speaking this morning. I can take it off. I got the okay. But... Uh, God is still in control, and we have to acknowledge that. So we pray for you folks down here at Fifth Avenue. Pray for us up at uh, Kenilworth. We have Stephen and Lois and Swain that have taken over many of my responsibilities as a full-time worker there and doing a great job. And uh, I thank the Lord for directing their steps to be with us for this two-year commitment. And then at the end of two years, they'll decide whether it's long-term or whether they'll move on to other things. If you have your Bible, turn to uh, Philippians chapter 4. I have several portions of scriptures that I'd like to get to this morning. And uh, sometimes it's hard to get them all in at the same time. One of the things that I'm struggling with uh, right now is, is, is kind of a really strange phenomena. The Lord has been good. I've been enjoying good health and strength, but there's, a, there's an issue that usually happens every day about this time in which my, for some reason, my ears get plugged up. And uh, it's incredible how it only happens at about this time. So I'm hearing a little bit of my echo as I speak to you this morning, I'm not sure. I've been to the doctor trying to find out what in the world is causing it. It's been going on for about two years now. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just a little bit uncomfortable because I can hear myself echo out my message. So I'll try my best to ignore that and just uh, speak with the power of the Spirit of God this morning to address these things to our hearts. Some time ago, there was a gospel track, I guess it was really a gospel track, it was a track that was written for believers to encourage them in their daily walk with the Lord. And uh, the title of this little pamphlet was, For This One Day, that was it, For This One Day, or For This Day Only, and went on to describe different mindsets, different attitudes that we can have as believers, especially as we go through Difficult times in which there's a lot of upheaval, uncertainty, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. So the, the track would go on to explain, oh, for this one day, and one day only, I will not, and then list on several items that we can work on. I thought I would try to work that message in this morning with a challenge in the time frame that we have as to the importance of each believer in the Lord Jesus Christ living a life that's fully committed to him, and seeing growth and development in your life day by day. This morning in my devotions, I picked up my daily sacrifice by Harry Ironside. I think he's with the Lord now, right? Oh, yeah. But for November 1st, this was what he wrote. It was on one of the verses that the Lord put in my heart to share this morning that we'll go to once we look at something here in Philippians. It's from uh, First and Second Peter. Besides this, 
giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Just a brief paragraph challenged my heart this morning. It says the Christian life should be one of continual growth and development. From the seed of faith, there should spring all of the fruit which is so precious in the eyes of the Lord and which results in a well-rounded spiritual experience. Saving faith is far more than an intellectual acceptance of certain revealed truths. What is it then? It is to trust in Christ alone and him alone for salvation. And this will be manifested by conformity to him. We grow as we feed upon the precious promises he has given to us in his word. Every one of these fulfilled in our own experience will encourage us, will encourage one of these to help others. Every one of those fulfilled is, there, is our own experience, will encourage us to confide in the word of God more implicitly. To ignore or neglect the word means a fruitless life and incapacity for service. I don't know about you, but I have repeated to myself over and over again in recent years, as I get older, I don't want to go empty handed. I want my life to count for the Lord. I want to use the talents and abilities that he has given to me through his Holy Spirit to bring honor and glory to his name. I have a life that's filled with good works. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 has another verse that goes along with that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, saving faith is what it's talked about. Each one of us needs to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we know the Lord. It could be I don't know everybody here. I know a good many of you. But if there are those that have never trusted Christ as their savior from sin, that this Sunday morning, November the 1st, 2020, in the midst of an epidemic, in the midst of all kinds of upheaval and turmoil, that you can find rest, comfort, and faith and forgiveness and a life that's worth living when you come to know him as your savior. Lord. Trust him, reach out to him today. Acknowledge that you need a Savior. I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. I'm not fearful of death. I'm not looking forward to it, perhaps, going through it. But I know that I'll be with him. And my life should be one that bears much fruit in his honor and his glory. How about you? Do you find that desire deep within your heart? You have only one life to live. Only what's done for Christ will really last. So much of our time sometimes is wasted. So the Lord has challenged me with this reading, this devotional thought this morning. Christian growth and development and maturity needs to be an ongoing process in our lives, day by day, week by week, month by month. Well, this little track helps us to focus in on just taking it one day at a time. One day at a time. You probably have gone up to different people, and even maybe this morning. I know I have. And I'll ask the question that's most often asked. How you doing? What's new? What's going on? What's happening? I'm not sure what your favorite expression is. Usually, the answer that I get back from a good many people is the answer in which they say, well, just taking it a day at a time. How many have ever used that? Yeah, just taking a day at a time. Each day is a precious gift from God to us. When I was a boy growing up, I wasn't allowed to listen to rock and roll music, okay? That was the in thing back in the 50s and 60s. Once in a while, I would sneak into my brother's room and we'd listen to a couple of songs. We used to listen to Harry Harrison. Does that name sound familiar to anybody? Harry Harrison. This jockey. And he would often say and give the challenge to his listening audience. 
You only have one day to live at a time. At a time. Each day is precious. Life is precious. Make the most of it. Don't waste your time. Make something happen in your life. Something to that effect and a challenge. I don't believe he was a Christian. Can't say for sure. But the challenge was way back in those days to me. In one day of life, one day at a time, one life to live. Make sure you do it good for him, well for him. So the first one he had in this little Jesus says, for this one day, I will say, Philippians 4.13. Let's see what Philippians 4.13 says. It's the keynote verse of the book of Philippians. Theme verse. Verse 13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. So for this one day, I'm going to say, I can do everything with his help who gives me the strength that I need to live for him. I know that all of us at times, if we're honest, we've tried to do things at our own strength and we seem to putter along and maybe fail. I've learned that I can't depend upon my own resources. I can't depend upon anything that's within me. I have to depend upon the spirit of God and the strength that he gives me. But I can consider to do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Have you ever been faced with a challenge that you seem as insurmountable and you say to yourself, there's no way there's no way that I'm going to take this. I never thought that I would be, at one point in my life, conducting and speaking at vacation Bible schools when I was a boy growing up. I would watch Ernie Gross come and I would watch these other people come and take the platform and just, just have the kids in their hands. And they, they went for the challenge. They went for the challenge. And uh, when you get challenges like that and you want to see something happen in your life, you say, I can't do it. I just don't have the strength. Remind yourself of this verse, and for this one day only, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. He has provided for us all that we need. He has provided for us in those verses that we read from Mr. Aaron's side from 2 Peter chapter 1. He has provided a spiritual endowment for each and every one of us. I want to turn there to 2 Peter now. So the your Bibles flip over. Second Peter chapter 1. Let's just talk about this spiritual endowment that has been about saved to us as believers. Second Peter chapter 1. The first four verses, Peter is going to give the basis for Christian growth. The basis for Christian growth is the common faith of believers. Simon Peter, verse 1, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, in order that by them he might become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruptions in the world through us. Common faith of fellow believers. We may not always agree on every aspect of Christian doctrine, but when it comes to the person and work of Christ, person who professes Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we should be able to have fellowship with that individual. We share something in common, a like precious faith. He calls it that, a like precious faith, a faith that is equally precious to all believers. This faith is the basis. It's the basis of Christian development and Christian growth in our lives and received as a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, as any man should boast. But then verse 10 is added for believers. Verse 10 is an awesome verse. Sometimes people say, well, what's, what's the purpose of works? If we're not saved by our good works, why even bother with it? Well, because God's plan, 
each believer. He foreordained that we should walk in a path of good works and service to him. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Folks, it's not a hit or miss proposition. God has ordained, it's preordained. He has set in motion a plan for each believer that we live lives that are productive, fruitful, multiply, bearing fruit for his honor. And, his glory. and he's giving us all that we need to get the job done. We can't, we don't need to depend upon ourselves. He gives us the strength. Well, let's see what's listed in this spiritual endowment. We see that in verses three and four. The common faith of believers is the basis of it. The spiritual endowment that he has given to us includes his divine power. His divine power, that is the dynamic of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to mention and talk and teach about the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. I've come to realize that in many of our circles and fellowships, there's a, a hesitancy to talk about the Spirit of God for fear that uh, we're going to be characterized as charismatic, speaking in tongues, and a part of that movement. The Spirit of God is part of the triune God. And he has dwelt the believer's life. We're not to quench him, we're not to grieve him. We allow the Spirit of God to have full sway and control in our lives. It's his power. And that's what he talks about here in this endowment, the spiritual dynamic of the Holy Spirit, bestowing on us, giving to us all things necessary for the realization of life and godliness. Thank God for the Spirit of God and His work in our lives. It makes us sensitive to the needs of others. We live in a world in which uh, sometimes we don't show much care towards one another. Maybe not so much in the assembly fellowships that we know of, but there's a real need for people to be encouraged in the things of God. And to, to know that there's a, there are people that care about them. And the Spirit of God can open up doors of witness for us. He's put us, ourselves, my wife and I, we've moved from the house that we lived in for the last 30 years. Uh, we're empty nesters, right? All six kids are, well, all five are married, maybe one's more yet to go. Uh, maybe one day Scott will surprise us all, right? <laughs> Even though he's 51, I don't know, it might happen. But, uh, I forget where I was going with that point. I better talk about anyway. I better drop that point in. <laughs> let's see what else. Let's see what else the spiritual endowment has. It makes, it, misses, it makes mention of his divine power and also in these verses of knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Full, personal, accurate knowledge. The Greek word is epigenosis there. It's a full, personal, accurate knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ. If we really don't get to know him throughout the course of our life, then we're missing the whole purpose of really knowing the Lord. He wants us to get to know him. He wants to reveal himself to us in our, in our lives. And he does that in a very special way through his word. A knowledge of himself. I'm amazed at the knowledge that some people have of the scriptures. It makes me envious. It gives me a motivation to want to be like that. I hear people that can quote scriptures, and uh, the scriptures becomes a sort of part and parcel of their lives. And uh, it's a challenge to me that each day, without fail, I can't afford, I can't afford to miss devotions. I can't afford to just skip Bible reading. I've got to do it. I've got to get my spiritual nourishment. Sometimes I think too much about food physically than I do about spiritual things. I was brought home last night, I was talking to my wife, and I said, I heard that our chapel is not gonna do away with the Thanksgiving Eve service. We're gonna go for it this year. I said, great. And then the first thing they said out of my mouth was, are they gonna have all the pies and cakes? And I'm like, no, we can't do that, no food. Well, how about coffee? No, no coffee, just fellowship. So I'm you know, getting used to that. It's been a big transition, but it really, 
it's not so much about the physical intake of food. It's really getting to know the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for us. To tell him every day that we love him and we value our friendship and our relationship with him. He wants us to depend upon him and to come to know that we can do all things through him who gives us the strength. What's something else that it gives in the spiritual endowment? In verse 4 again. His word, we talked about that, infinitely valuable and exceedingly great promises have been given to us. Promises from God's word. There are many of them. I think I've spoken on this one particular one here in years gone by. The one promise that I hold to very dearly is that I will never leave you. What's the, what's the rest of it? Nor I'll ever forsake you. Tragic sometimes when you see families that have been disrupted by divorce. Children are affected. It's wonderful to be able to come up, up to anybody that is a believer and say, you know, when you come to put your faith in Christ, he will never leave you. A little preposition in, you mentioned about this morning, it's found 90 times. 90 times in the six chapters of Ephesians. We are in Christ. Nothing separates the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It can't be taken away from you. You cannot lose your salvation. I know Galatians 5 will challenge you on that, falling from grace. But that's a different standard. That's just leaving the spirit of grace in how you live out your Christian life. It's all by God's grace. But by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. Promises from God. Not every promise in the book is ours. Not every promise is ours. There are promises designed for the nation of Israel, not for the church. But we have enough of God's many bountiful promises provided for us in the word of God. I will give unto them eternal life. And they shall what? Never perish. He that hath the Son has life. But he that has not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Promises that are there for us to hold on to as we move our way through life. He's also given us, according to these verses here, you see this also in verse 4, a new nature. A regenerate nature. The word in the Greek is koinoi, partakers, fellow partners of the divine nature. A new nature. It's really important, isn't it, that we feed not only our physical bodies, but that we feed our spiritual bodies. Feed that new nature. I think sometimes we, and I know I see it in all life, I tend to excuse behavior patterns that aren't honoring to the Lord. And I tend to just not deal with sinful attitudes as harshly as I should. To come to come to the Lord and say, Lord, if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of my sins. And to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. To keep the late the slate clean. It's hard not to go on your computer these days. I sat there yesterday reading the missionary letters on one side. And on the other side, things I shouldn't be looking at. Click that side off. I, you know, it's hard to be a Christian, to be holy, and to live a life separated from sin. God wants us to feed that new nature, starve the old nature. Don't let it fester, don't let it grow. Things that are being done, you know, are harmful. Get rid of it. And you'll find that you'll be growing in your relationship with the Lord. Well, let's go back to Philippians for a minute. There's another one in Philippians chapter 4. For this one day, for this one day, I will not worry about my needs. Look at chapter 4 and verse 19. My God 
shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This one day, as a believer, I'm not going to worry about my needs. But the same God who takes care of me will supply all my needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Paraphrase of Philippians 4. 19. These verses really are Paul's testimony of God's peace in his life, his contentment in the Lord. He knew that God would provide for his needs. Verse 11, verse 12. I know how to get along with humble means and also know how to live in prosperity in any in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who gives me the strength. My 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. <laughs> we have a wonderful God. One title that he has is Jehovah Jireh. Anybody know what that means? God will provide. God will provide. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, he used to sing his kids, the wealth in every land. His needs, our needs can be met. I look back on seeing how God has worked in our lives. We were commended to the Lord's work back in 1969. 1970. I don't know how in the world we were able to get six kids through college. It was never a bill that was never paid. It was not paid on time. God provides. He takes good care of his own. He'll take care of you. Whatever need that you find yourself in. God will supply your needs. That's not so much your wants. When I was a kid growing up, there was a car, two of them, in fact, identical except for the color, parked on my block. 1951 Mercury's. To this day, I dream someday of owning one. You probably don't even know what it looks like. That was a cool car. That was just a want. But you know, sometimes the Lord is gracious enough to not only give us our wants, but he gives us, or our needs rather, but he gives us our wants. My son Scott was a good example of that because he was looking for a new vehicle. And he wanted to get one in a particular model that he had owned once before and he was happy with it. He kept looking and looking and not finding it. One day, I guess it was almost like the Lord said, okay, you prayed enough about this, I'm going to let you have what you want. And he did. He provided him with the same model, same color. I can't even forget the name of the car. Do you know what he drives? I don't know. I remember the story. Yeah. But uh, so, you know, God provides sometimes above and beyond what we need. He's a gracious God. He loves to give. He's given us so many things to help us in our walk with him. How about another one here? For this one day, I will not be afraid. What we looked at so far is, for this one that I will say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Number two, for this one day, I will not worry about my needs. For my God shall supply all my needs. And this third one is, for this one day, I will not be afraid. Second Timothy 1, 7, we know that verse by heart. Many of us, I will not be afraid. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and cowardice timidity, but of power, of love, and of self-discipline. How many of us perhaps are fearful at times living in the days in which we live? Having to wear a mask, how to have separation. I can't, I'm so used to being an affectionate person, I want to hug everybody. Can't do it. Elbows, wrists, Philly even gave me the need this morning, <laughs> joking around. But uh, 
We don't have to be afraid. We're in good hands. You know, quick illustration. When I was a college student, I was involved with a group called Operation Mobilization. I had the opportunity to go to Spain for the summer of 1964 and do missionary work. It was great, a great experience. I'll never forget at the end of the tour was over, the teams were done. We were all were supposed to meet back in Madrid and then go to Zaragoza. And from there, we would go back home. Well, when we met, all the team members from all over Spain came. They ran out of room for all the students to get in the vehicles. And I was one that was left out. So they told me, well, what we want you to do is we'll give you $10 and hitchhike, 250 miles to Zaragoza. I said, sure, I was, I, I was fine. I used to hitchhike from Emmaus to New York many, many times. I had a system. But, uh, so I got, in this, I got in this, put my thumb out on the road, got picked up just like that. But in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, this truck driver was gonna go to the right. And I had to go straight. He dropped me off. And here I was all alone in the middle of nowhere. And for the first time in a long time, I was afraid. It was getting dark. I just knew what I was going to do. I said, Lord, help me. I need one more ride. We'll do it. No sooner after that prayer was offered, then another vehicle came by, picked me up. He took me not only to Zaragoza, but he knew the street where I was supposed to go, where the church was. He took me right there to the front door. I said, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you. That's one of the illustration of many that many do and did. He's not giving us a spirit of fear, cowardice, to be a witness for him, to stand and to share your faith with others. So may you be challenged this morning just to take it a day at a time. Look to him for what you need. He will provide. And he'll take good care of you. I'd like to have it be great if everyone just would raise their hand, but I, I don't like doing that. But I hope that everyone can raise their hand and say, yes, I believe that. I believe that God can and has done wonderful things for me. He saved me, brought me into his family. And I can walk by faith and give for him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be together this morning for fellowship, for breaking of bread, for hearing the word, for singing these songs, for the special music, both in Spanish and English. Oh, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for the power of your word. Help us not to be afraid. Help us, Lord, to realize that you do provide for our needs. And that we can do all things that gives us the strength to face whatever comes our way in life. Part us with your blessing, we pray. Give you our thanks in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen.